I'm going to share from the book of Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4. But I think we'll read that portion of scripture towards the end. <laughs> we'll read that portion of scripture. I'm married to one wife who is a she, and she's a woman. <laughs> uh, you know, now, now we, have to, we have to be specific, and together we have one beautiful um, daughter. Who is a she? <laughs> yes. And uh, I think I was telling Pastor Steve, we happen to be in the same CJ. Um, my daughter turned nine months, and uh, she was in her mother's womb for nine months. Is she born again? <laughs> Because I'm a pastor. <laughs> Before the first man fell into sin, identity came first and purpose followed. Before the first man fell into sin, identity came first and purpose followed. And we get to see in the book of Genesis 1 that God created man in his image and, and likeness. And image is different from likeness. Image, we are spiritual beings. The Bible says that God is spirit. God is spirit. And God being spirit, whenever God says, let us make man in our image, this is the triune God having a boardroom. And they said when we make man in our image, it speaks of the spiritual aspect. You are a spiritual being. First Thessalonians fires. 523 to 24. You are a spiritual being, but you have a body and a soul. The word likeness means to function like God. It doesn't mean that you are God, but you function like God. So when the Bible says, let us make man, you are a spiritual being and you have a body and a soul. So with our bodies, we are world conscious. That's why after some time, you will go open the fridge and get something to eat. With our souls, we are self-conscious. This is where we get to find that our heart and our emotions, our thoughts, our thinking, and this is where your will lies. So the will to do whichever thing you would want to do. This is where our mind is. And so, in Genesis 1, God had spoken had spoken in the invisible spiritual realm. When we get to Genesis 2, Genesis 1, when God said, let us make man, the word man is plural, meaning male and female, meaning that male and female were created on the same day in the invisible spiritual realm. And then God said, God gave them their purpose. He told them to have dominion to have dominion, and, and God being the creator, he made man, male and female, to be creative. Genesis 2, when you go to Genesis 2, you find something interesting and false. The word man there is used interchangeably, and in this context, you find the word man is Adam. So in the physical, visible world, Adam came first. So, when Adam came first, God put a soul and a body. That's why you find God goes down and forms man. And then he breathes his life into him. And then it's amazing that the woman came from the man, not because of her lips, hips, and fingertips, but God fashioned the woman and they were having a union. This is the first wedding that we got to see. The first wedding was a garden wedding. And we find the author of the institution of marriage is God. And this marriage is between male and female, not male or all those other things that we know. Because we are going as per the divine absolutes, meaning that the identity of man comes from God. That makes you to be a child of God. That makes you to be a child of God. And once you get to know your identity, your purpose follows. And this was before the fall of man. Genesis 3 unfolds, and the thing that happens here, we find that this guy called the enemy who came in form of a serpent came as a cunning 
person or came as a cunning um, animal and he was skillful in achieving one's end by deceit. The serpent was shrewd and sensible and, and prudent, but in a negative way. The, the serpent was sneaky. And, and if you go to Genesis 3.13, when Eve is not Eve, the woman, because Eve is named Ukochini. When the woman partook of the fruit, what did she say? That the serpent deceived me. Now the Old Testament was written in Hebrew, and we are going to walk into that. The word deceived comes from the Hebrew word no show, and it has a number of connotations. And one, it means to lead astray mentally. To lead astray mentally. It means to delude or morally to seduce. Again, it means to beguile or to charm or attract or to interest, to deceive. And this makes me get to a place of questioning the serpent and the woman when they were having a conversation that when you eat of this tree, you will become like God. Could it be a one-time conversation or something that continued happening because the serpent was trying to sow seeds of discord? And at one time, he will come and tell Eve, I see you're having a good time with your man, you know, ah. There are no other men in this world, as in he's one in a million and etc. And then he will try to poke seeds, to send seeds of discord in terms of, did your man hug you yesterday? I didn't see you. As in yesterday, you guys did not close the branches or the curtains while you are <laughs> knowing each other and etc. For me, I, I, I'm, I'm seeing it as a conversation that kept on happening and happening and the enemy was trying to sow seeds of discord so that Eve will get to the place that what God had told her, because God had said, let us make man in our image. The serpent said that if you partake of this fruit, you will be like God. And already they had been created in the image of God. What a form of deception. And you see, our thoughts are seeds. Our thoughts are seeds. The more we tend the seeds, they take root and they become fruit. And the fruit are the results of our actions. Our thoughts are seeds. And whenever Eve ate of that fruit, she gave to her husband. And that is why now we are seeing Things like sexual immorality. We are seeing homosexuality. We are seeing backstabbing, backbiting, unforgiveness. We are seeing death. In fact, when Eve was in the garden, when the woman came to the garden, everything was good. Everything was good. Everything. The only part that God says it is not good is when Adam was alone. And God said it is not good for man now, Adam, to be alone. And I will make him a suitable helper. Meaning that when the serpent came and sowed seeds of discord, that was when now the world of bad things began happening. And when all this was happening, God comes in. You see, when sin is introduced, Jesus has to be introduced. Genesis 3.15 is the word proto-evangelium, which speaks of the seed of the, of the woman who will crush the head of the serpent. I believe we all have our moments when it comes to the Garden of Eden. We may all have our moments where everything is good, but there comes a time where the enemy comes and sows seeds of discord. He comes to sow seeds of doubt. He comes to try to ask you questions where you will doubt the love of God. You will doubt the goodness of God. You will doubt whether what you're doing is right. You will doubt whether, whether, whether you, the people that you have or the things that you have or whichever thing that God has given you is of God. 
There's a story of a woman called Sarah Jakes. Um, I'm sure you know Sarah Jakes, daughter to T.D. Jakes. And she was saying when they were in Charleston, uh, before Charleston, the place that they were in, the church was so small that it had around 200 people. She used to sit next to her father. But the moment they moved to Potter's house, Dallas, the church had, was filled and they had over 2,500 people. And then it got to a time that the enemy started sowing seeds of discord. She, the enemy started saying that you're not loved. Look at where you're seated. You're seated at the back. Look at your dad. He's talking to the other people. Look at your dad. Doesn't even have time for you. And you see, when, the, when, when our thoughts, our thoughts, when our thoughts, when we take care of them, when we tend them, they take root and they become fruit. And Sarah Jake started to look for affirmation many places. And that's why at a very young age, she became pregnant. You see, we all have our moments where the enemy may come and sow seeds of discord. And before the first man fell into sin, identity came first and purpose followed. But now we are living in a world where people want to know their purpose without knowing who they are. And someone who doesn't know who they are, that's why you will end up doing many things. You will end up doing something that you're not supposed to do because comparison is something that is flowing. You compare yourself, you compare your seeds with other people's fruits. You compare their highlight reels and you compare what other people are doing or what other people have. You compare because you see this is the cost that is being done and it is see people have boyfriends and you yourself, you are as single as a mango seed and you want to... <laughs> <laughs> you want to enter into a relationship. But once you know who you are, comparison is not something that will be part of you. And remember, Adam and Eve, they see fig leaves. And then they hid from God. Imagine they were hiding from their source of identity. And I believe today we are living at a time where people have sealed fig leaves. We have sealed fig leaves because of our misdeeds. We have sealed fig leaves, fig leaves of work, fig leaves of, of, of relationships, fig leaves of being on our phones, fig leaves of, I don't, I don't know what you're thinking because now I know that you can fill in. If you're hiding yourself from God, and that is where you pick a nefarious purpose and something called self-labeling becomes your identity. And you say, that's how I was born. But remember how did God create man? It was man and woman. Fast forward. Matthew chapter 4. Before Matthew chapter 4, it's interesting that Jesus himself, before he began his earthly ministry, the Bible says that it's where he was baptized. And you see the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit come together at one place. And God said, this is my beloved Son in whom... I am well pleased, meaning that he was affirmed. And then Matthew chapter 4, I think we can read it. Matthew chapter 4, I'll read verse 1 to, verse 1 to 4. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to, to be tempted by the devil. After fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, if you are the son of God. Tayari amesha shoiwa. Okay, subtitles. Already he's been affirmed and he's been told <laughs> that he is the son of God. And remember when you are made in the image of God, you've been made to function like God. And now the enemy comes, and theologians, by the way, say some theologians, that this temptation happened in the mind. How can you carry Jesus, yet he is God? If 
you are the son of God. And this man had fasted 40 days. Ushai fast 40 days. Mse tumbo na mgongo ina kwanga imeshikana. If you are the son of God. You know, it's so interesting that you may come to this church and we may speak all manner of things. We may tell you that you are the apple of his eye. You are the head and not the tail. You are above and not beneath. You are more than a conqueror. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. But then when you leave the four walls of the church, iki <laughs> nikinini. If you are the son of God. And remember, Jesus was in a place of need. He had been affirmed. And then Satan asks him, if you are the son of God, meaning that the enemy will tempt you at your point of need. The enemy will tempt you at your point of need. And it's interesting because once you know who you are, you will use the right words. Once you know who you are, you will use the right words. Sorry, that's my second point. The first point is, once you know who you are, you will be empowered to prevail against the enemy of our souls. Once you know who you are, empowers you to prevail against the enemy of our souls. Remember, it's about the mind. It's about the mind. We are spiritual beings. When we get born again, our spirits are only saved, but our minds, we have to keep on renewing them. That's why Paul says in the book of Romans chapter 12, that we have to keep on reading the word of God so that we are being transformed into his likeness. We be like Christ because that is where we get our identity from. Knowing who you are empowers you to prevail against the enemy of our souls. And you do not have to prove yourself or to anyone that you are God's child. You do not have to prove yourself. You've already been made in the image of God. Some theologians say that that first temptation, if Jesus would have turned the stone into bread and eaten, he would have died. Because you can't fast for 40 days and then you take solid food. And you see, the mission of the enemy, he doesn't want you to know who you are. And that's why he will try to abort you knowing who you are. Because once you know who you are, you'll know who you are not. You will know that you have been empowered. Let me ask you this question. Before I ask the question, you will also not go by opinions of what people say. You know, people may have opinions about you. And the opinions of people may take you down because sometimes it's what people say to us and what we say to ourselves that takes us down. But what does God say about you? This question is for you if you're taking notes and you're writing. What area of need is the enemy tempting you in? What area of need is the enemy tempting you in? What area of need is the enemy tempting you in? And how will you overcome it? The second one is, once you know who you are, you will use the right words. Matthew chapter 4, verse 5 to 7 then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written. He will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Once you know who you are, you will use the right words. And by doing so, you will not put God to the test and fulfill other non-purposeful things. And that means that when you're going through a difficult time, we tend to test God. People that are suffering mentally, they test God. Because you want God to come there 
and we find this in the book of 1 Kings 18, they were told to call Baal, and they started to test God instead of trusting God. And that's why they started cutting themselves. But once you know who you are, you will not lead yourself to self-destruct. And the question that I want, you, I want to ask you is, evaluate the words you use as a Christian. Are they godly? Evaluate the words that you use as a Christian. Are they godly? If not, what can you do now? If yes, how can you ensure that you constantly use those words? Jesus was defeating the enemy through the words that he used, and those were scripture. The last one is, once you know who you are, you will know your assignment or purpose. And that purpose is to serve God and carry his agenda. And this is the last portion of scripture from verse 8. Again, the devil took him to a high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and angels came and attended to him. Meaning that once you know who you are, you will know your purpose is to serve God and to carry his agenda. You will develop a hunger for the things of God, no matter where you are. Jesus said, my food is to do the will of my father, meaning that his purpose kept him hungry to see him fulfill or accomplish that which God had called him to do. Whichever place you may be planted, whichever place, whether at home, whether in school, whether in the workplace, you obeying, you just obeying and following what God says, you are fulfilling the purposes of God. You will develop that hunger for the things of God no matter where he plants you. You will do great exploits and all these other things will follow you. And as they follow you, you will experience the provision of God. You will, experiencing, you will experience everything that God has called you to do. And as I finish, how will you get to know your purpose now that you're here? And I want us to bow down our heads And as we bow down our heads, I can sense in my spirit that there are quite a number of us that the enemy has sowed seeds of doubt for you to doubt God. I can sense that the enemy has sent many of us to a place that we have picked up other purposes and these are destructive purposes. I can sense that there are some of us are in this place and you've picked up self-labeling. And you see, whenever you fall short, because we all fall short, sin says, I've made a mistake. Shame says, I am the mistake. And that's self-labeling. But you are not that. I can sense there are some of us because of culture and because of social media and because of our upbringing, some of us haven't been brought up by father figures. Either some of us, our fathers haven't been present. Um, they are, they, 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 we have been misfathered or we have been unfathered. Some of us have been misfathered and some have been underfathered because of drunkenness, divorce, separation or whichever thing. And you see something about a father. The word father means source, meaning that the father is the source of our identity. A father is a male representation of God, and we see a father like a, we see God
God as a warrior. We see God as a protector. We see God who instills discipline. And a father is like the mirror, the mirror, the mirror that reflects the image of God. Unfortunately, because of being misfathered, underfathered, and unfathered, the mirror has cracked. And some of us are craving, are craving the discipline. Some of us are craving the who I am in God. Some of us are struggling in our relationship with God because we haven't been brought up with, with our fathers. And I am here to tell you that it is still possible. I am here to introduce you back to this God who is your father. I am here to introduce you to this God who says that he is the one who gives you your identity. He is the one who gives you your purpose. He is the one who formed you and fashioned you. He is the one who keeps on speaking over your life. He says that you can do this. He says that you don't need anyone as long as you have God. He is going to help you. He is going to walk with you as long as you have God. God, he is your source of provision. He is the one that you should run to because you have God. He is the one who will strengthen you in a world that is so cold, in a world where men are being beaten and the enemy is after the man, in a world where the enemy is after the woman. He knows that when a man and a woman comes together, they will be able to know their identity and who they are and the world will be made better. But the enemy is trying to sow seeds of doubt, seeds of discord that you will never make it in school, that you will never be provided for, but I am here to speak to you today. God is speaking over your life. God says that he will supply all your needs according to his riches in glory. God says that it is written. You may think that you are alone, that you are lonely. You've been single and you've seen other people are like being taken and you yourself, you've been alone. God is saying that he has you. This is the time that he is working in you. You have God you're here you're saying I just need to be prayed for just lift up your hand thank you thank you thank you thank you for those, hand, those hands just lift up your hand you're lifting them to God you're lifting them to God he is the one who is, who is, he is the one who is and is to come. He is your provider, he is your protector, he is your healer, he is your deliverer. And I want you to say that the things that you are doing in, in, in the dark places, I want to say that those are not you, that is not you, because that is human doing, but it's about identity, and identity is about becoming that which God has called you. So things like pornography a human doing things like masturbation a human doing things like gossip and backbiting these are human doing but there's a God who is calling you into this journey of becoming the greatness that God has imputed in you God has called you and he is going to plant you he is going to use you because you've chosen to know who you are father you see those hands Father, how we pray that you minister to them right now in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, they are getting to, re to remember who they are in you, O oh God. Father, we are speaking against the vials of the enemy, O oh God. The seeds of discord, the seeds of doubt, the seeds that the enemy is trying to say that they will never make it. They will never get out of their situation. Right now, we refuse the works of the enemy in the name of Jesus. And lastly, you're here and you're saying, you can put your hands down with your heads bowed. You're here and you're saying you want to give your life to Jesus. Just lift up your hand because it begins from that place. It begins from that place. Thank you for that hand. You're lifting it to God. I remember making that decision in 2002, 2007, December 2nd, and I have never been the same again. Thank you for those hands. Thank you for those hands. Thank you for those hands. Thank you. Church, I want us, even with our heads bowed, for them that have lifted up their hands, I just want you to start interceding for them. I just want you to start praying for them. I just want you to start praying for them that they will get to know who they are in this Jesus. Thank you, King of Glory. 
Thank you, Lord of Lords. Thank you, Jesus. I just want you, if you've lifted up your hand, just repeat this prayer with me. Say, Lord God, thank you for today my identity is in you. The old is gone and the new has come. Surround me with your goodness, with your word. Thank you, Lord. Because once we know who we are, we will know who we are not. The past is behind us. In Jesus' name, amen.